passing comes from the book of Psalms. It is responsive. Deal thou plea with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may see wondrous things from your law. Teach me the word the way of your statutes, and I shall speak it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. And indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline mine ear to your testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking up for earthly things, and revive me in your way. Our second lesson comes from Ephesians. I pray that the eyes of your hearts may enlighten in order that you may know the hope to which God has called you, the riches of his glories, inheritance in his holy people, his incomparable great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength God exerted when he we believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength. Whoops. Raise Christ from the dead and seateth him in the right hand in the heavenly realms for above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Our third lesson comes from Mark. Jesus returned in his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That passage that Julie just read, that last one from Mark, And one other that I read this week, and another that I've studied this week, gave birth to this morning's sermon topic. I'm amazed to read in Mark 6 that the lack of people's faith seemed to have restricted our Lord's healing ability. We aren't told He didn't he chose not to heal them. We are told he could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. That's one. Matthew 28, 17. Somebody look it up. Read it for us. Matthew 28, 17. While looking it up, I'll remind you about John the Baptizer. Remember when he was in prison, languishing in prison as Jesus began his ministry? John the Baptizer sent word to Jesus. What did he ask Jesus? Are you the, Are one? You the one? Wow. Whatever John's expectations were involving Jesus to that point in his life had not been met by Jesus. And he had begun to doubt. Are you the one? Matthew 28, 17, anybody? When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. When they, who's they? The disciples. The disciples. 
This is 40 days or so after Jesus was raised from the dead, hello, and had visited the disciples several times. And here at this moment, when he's about to ascend back to the Father, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Doubted what? We shake our heads because we think we're not like that. At least once every three years during the Easter season, we revisit the post-resurrection appearance of our Lord to the disciple whose friends called him Didymus, the twin, but whom we know better as Thomas. He has long served as the New Testament's go-to guide, the church's whipping post, when the sermon topic is faith versus doubt. So during the Holy Week slash Resurrection Day slash Easter season cycle of the church year, when Christians are called upon to believe a whole lot of things which can only be believed by faith, Thomas's story should be part of the conversation. Nearly all of us, I suspect, think that we know what faith is. Dr. Webster says faith is a firm belief in something for which there is no proof. He also says faith is belief and trust and loyalty to God. That's a kind of a secular description of a religious understanding of faith. That is good so far as it goes, but the very best definition of faith I'm aware of particularly of biblical faith, faith that is understood in the scriptures, is Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Some of us might have said that to memory. Hebrews 11, 1 to 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it, by faith, the elders gained a good testimony. That's the New King James. Here is the NLT. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot yet see. God gave his approval to people in days of old because of their faith. Now, we've read those two verses in so many different Bible translations that I think we have stopped thinking about what is actually being declared here. It's a rather astonishing collection of sentences. Faith, according to the New Testament, is a spiritual gift. Do you understand that? You only have the kind of faith the Bible talks about, the kind of faith defined in Hebrews 11.1, 1, if you've been given it by God. I mean, we can have faith on our own. It's a pretty flimsy, shabby thing. But it is not the faith that's being talked about in Hebrews. That faith, that kind of faith is supernatural. It is of divine origin. And the writer of Hebrews says it has substance. And for the anointed believer, faith is real and true evidence. Evidence sufficient for belief. Now you say, well, I wouldn't stand for evidence in a court of law. No, it wouldn't. But in the heavenly realms, the fact is, the faith that God gives us has substance. It is almost tactile. It bears weight. It provides confident assurance. Faith that is not the same thing as wishing or even hoping that God's promises are true and worthy of our trust. Christians anointed with the gift of faith believe they are true. God's promises are true. And that God is worthy to be trusted, that he will keep his promises. You do believe that, don't you? Somebody say amen. 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 Now do you believe it all the time? Do you? And you're a better person than I am. There are times I forget to believe. 
Oh, there are times I say I believe, but my attitude de denies that. I, I, I believe God keeps promises, but I act like I'm desperate. I act like I've, I'm out of answers. I can't, I can't help myself. See, God's onto that. And it's okay. Let's talk about doubt, because this wonderful little book, as you should all read, called The Gift of Doubt by Gary Parker. He calls <coughs> Faith and Doubt the Odd, the odd Couple. The two things that exist at the same time in Christians. Dr. Webster defines doubt as the uncertainty of belief and also as the inclination not to believe or the inclination not to accept. The two Greek words rendered as doubt in the New Testament mean to judge diversely or to stand divided. Now that works for me. I believe, said the father of the son born blind. Help my unbelief. I've always thought, and I think maybe I've been taught, that faith and doubt are incompatible. But are they? Are faith and doubt, at least the kind of doubt which might be rightly defined as logical doubt, is that kind of faith truly incompatible, that kind of doubt, pardon me, truly incompatible with the by faith Christian life? I wondered about that. Because we are told, at least in one place in the Bible, that doubt has no place in the Christian activity. What activity is that? We are, we are given no wiggle room for doubt when we pray, James 1. We'll read that at the end of the sermon. If we pray with doubt, God says, don't bother Yet, doubt is part of who we are. We are humans. We hold these treasures of faith, all these things we believe, these fantastic things we believe by faith. We hold them in our drawers and play our logical minds, our, our private wishes and wants, our own imaginations. We can see evidence. And we are told to have faith in spite of what we see. And it's hard sometimes. Sometimes it's impossible. Osgoodness writes, doubt is not the same thing as unbelief. So doubt is not the opposite of faith. Rather, doubt is a state of mind in suspension between faith and unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. Because faith is crucial, doubt is serious, Dennis writes, but because doubt is not unbelief, it is not terminal. It is only a halfway stage that can lead can lead to deepen faith as easily as it can break down to unbelief. If a belief cannot withstand hard questioning, <coughs> William Cordovan writes, it may not be worth holding on to. <clears throat> if Christianity is true, it should be able to withstand the hardest questions we can bring to it. Conversely, if Christianity is not true, he writes, we should reject it. So, here we are. And the perfect guy to think about when we talk about this at this season of the year is Thomas. Let's turn in our Bibles to John 20. As you turn in your Bibles, I'll pray. Lord, guide us in this consideration of your word. Father, guide us in our thoughts. Anoint our ears and our hearts. Anoint the lips of your servant that your word may be spoken, brought forth clearly. Father, I believe that those of us who are here this morning are here by appointment, by divine appointment, that you have something to say to each of us. So, Father, give us grace to hear. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 20. You know the story as well as I do. So we pick up anything different in this reading of it. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that first day, that's Resurrection Day, on the evening of Resurrection Day, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. 
the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Other gospel accounts are not quite so kind to the disciples. Mostly, when they saw Jesus, they thought he was a ghost. And they were terrified until they said, peace be unto you. John plays it a little cool. They were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then Jesus said this, according to John, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is another telling of the Great Commission. <coughs> if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. There's a sermon in that first fragment. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Another sermon there. Now, verse 24. Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So he missed that scene. Jesus didn't breathe on Thomas. I find that intriguing. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord! But he said to them, Oh, yeah, right. Well, he really said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. There. Why didn't Thomas believe? It's a fantastic thing to hear. <laughs> That's why. He's been hiding out by himself for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus has been dead for three days. Come on, that's this, this not a stretch here. Who would tell you that? And you would not say, oh yeah, that's great news, thanks. You know. What? Come on. That's wishful thinking at the very best. I need proof, Thomas said. And the disciples kind of act like they didn't need proof. <laughs> they did, didn't they? They were hiding out, we just read, and, and Jesus had shown them his hands and his side. They had already seen it. They had empirical evidence that void their faith. A week later, a week goes by. I find that intriguing too. What was Thomas thinking all that week? Was he asking around? Did he, resume, did he, did he go back to his hiding place and, and nurse his doubts and crushed beliefs by himself? A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them this time. And stood among them, and Jesus said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And so Thomas walked out and put his finger in. No, he didn't. What did Thomas do? He fell on his face. And what did he say? What a mouthful that is. Nowhere else in Scripture do we read any other disciples saying that. My Lord and my God. They roll off our tongues way too easily, those two words. But Thomas knew what it meant to call Jesus Lord. It was saying the, the Christian creed. Christ is Lord and Caesar is not. Christ is, Christ is Lord and your appetites are not. Christ is Lord, and all your crises are not. And my God, that is Thomas saying, I know you are not just a rabbi. I know you are not just a prophet sent from God. I know that you are God. Of course you fall on your face when you say that and understand what you're saying. Then Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He's talking about you and me. We believe things that we have not seen. We believe with the faith God gives us to believe. Which is the substance of the things we believe. 
and the evidence of things we believe. Every three or so years, we have to ask ourselves this question, what does this familiar story, which we revisit at least once during the three-year cycle, every Easter season, what does this report teach us about our own doubts? I made a list for myself. Listen. This lesson, for me, teaches me that doubt is not the same thing as cynical skepticism. And it is also not a form of disobedience, because the text indicates, I think, that Thomas really and truly wanted to believe. Show me his hands and his, and his wounds and his side, I'll believe. This report teaches me that doubt is a natural byproduct of my humanity, my state of mind in suspension between the things I believe in by faith and the things I have a hard time believing. That's the suspension we all stand in. We stand closer to the faith side when we're in a good place in our lives, when we feel like standing up and sharing our testimony. And we're standing closer to the unbelief side of our thinking when our lives are collapsing all around us. Nothing that we hope for is happening. Everything we fear is happening. And we forget and we have, begin to have doubts. You say, well, you know, I, I never really doubt that God exists or that God is out there, but... You begin to wonder if he's really got your best interest at heart, or if you and he are really on the same wavelength about this here thing. This, this, this text teaches me that, Tom, that God does not, Jesus does not judge us for our doubts, but also that he seems to expect more of us. I, I cut Thomas some slack. He wasn't there when Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on the other disciples, but all of us believe that we have received the Holy Spirit. And so, Jesus might logically expect us not to have doubts. But as I said before, we hold these treasures in jars of clay. Here's something else I think that this text teaches us in a roundabout way. That doubt for the genuine Christian in the power of the Holy Spirit will ultimately resolve in spiritual truth. I believe that. The story is that Thomas became the first missionary to India. Remember, we had the pastor here in our church many years ago who was pastor of the Church of St. Thomas. As far as we know, the oldest continually meeting congregation in all Asia. So that moment in Thomas's life, which we've allowed in our minds to define him, is not really fire, it's not really fair. It must be said uh, at this juncture that uh, Thomas has been given a bum rap. We'll get to that in a second. Now, what does this story teach us about faith? Or what does this story suggest about the components of authentic Christian faith, which I think you all claim to have, and which we agree is of divine origin, that even disciples sometimes show up in their faith. That's fair enough. That all those who have come to God through faith in Jesus Christ may also struggle with doubt. Not just the original 11 disciples, but us too. It depends on your disposition. Did you know that? Some people, I think, are more inclined, are more open to the unexplained. It's basically part of their nature. All of us, I think, are given the power to think like that by the Holy Spirit. But some of us have a disposition which is more open. Open. Less cynical. It also depends on the nature of the circumstance, which is testing our faith. You think of any? What might bring doubt into your faith in Jesus Christ? What might bring doubt into your faith in God's goodness? In God's wisdom? In God's accessibility? I can think of several. Any kind of tragedy, especially <coughs> ones of long, painful duration, 
which have, in your opinion, happened to you. You didn't cause this. I didn't mean to get sick. I got sick. I didn't mean for my child to become the ultimate labor of my life. I didn't plan for, I didn't do anything stupid to cause my financial ruin or cause my spouse to walk out on me. I didn't do that. You begin to wonder, where's God going? If God is so good, why is there so much suffering in the world? I heard Carol ask that this morning. If God is so good, if Jesus loves me, why is my life so full of trouble? Why is this going on? I didn't ask for this, and I'm having a hard time with it. Why doesn't God step in and, I'd like to take it away, at least make it easier to handle? So, your disposition is one factor, your immediate circumstance is another. Another is, maybe the most important one is, the degree of isolation that has come into your life that separates you from the church. If you decide to tough this out by yourself like Thomas did, you are robbing yourself of some really important resources that God has given the church. He's given those in the pews beside you the gift of encouragement, the gift of helps, the gift of a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom who can talk to you and inform you and encourage you and give you something to think about, pray for you. You tough it out on your own, you are cutting yourself off from all those resources. You can't get beyond God's reach, don't get me wrong. But all of these things, your psychological makeup, the <coughs> intense nature of the circumstance you're in right now, and your proximity to the church community, all of these are factors in making doubt seem sometimes overwhelming, and faith seems so unbelievable. Not up to the job. Like I said, Thomas gets a bum rap because of this moment of doubt, which he was totally honest about. In John 11, remember, when Jesus heard the word about Lazarus, our brother is dying, said Mary and Martha, please come. And Jesus said, well, we'll wait a few days and we'll go. But of course, Lazarus lived near Jerusalem where Jesus was a wanted man, and the disciples didn't like the idea of going at this time of the year coming up, Passover to Jerusalem when religious fervor was so high and they tried to talk Jesus out of going. What did Thomas say? Ah. We followed him all this time, we may as well die with him. I mean, Thomas, he had courage. It was flawed and, and, and a little fatalistic, but Thomas was one that said, we better go. We're all in this. Let's go, let's, let's, let's walk into the teeth of danger with Jesus. And when Jesus was getting real theological, saying things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father except by me, it was only Thomas who was bold enough to say, we don't know what you mean. We don't understand that. That's way over our heads, until Jesus explained. So Thomas was an active member of the group who was only remembered by us because of this one moment of doubt. But he had some virtues, and even this situation shows the virtue of the side of Thomas, he refused to say he believed what he didn't believe. He refused to pretend that he had no doubts. William Barclay writes, there was an uncompromising honesty about Thomas. He absolutely refused to say that he believed when he did not believe. He would never try to steal his doubts by pretending that they did not exist. I've been guilty of that. Sometimes I offer up the most shallow prayers in the midst of the crisis when I really think it's all going to pieces. And I say the words, but my faith is somewhere else. And as I said, Thomas, once he was given the evidence that he needed, that his faith needed, he was all in. became one of the key members of our Lord's church. Now, here's things to think about. Christian faith is a progressive phenomenon. In our sacred journey 
Our faith proceeds step by step, sometimes in fits and starts. Paul said, from faith to faith. As we spend time in the Word, as we grow in the nurture and admonition of the Scriptures, as we connect to a community of saints and interact and pray for and be prayed for in community, our faith kicks up to another level. Now some of you are stuck in a spot. Your faith hasn't done any jumping in a long time. It's something that has either blocked you from trusting God for this thing or you've been so lackadaisical in your attention to your faith that it has become kind of a still, a still thing in your life. It's a factor. It's, uh, it's somewhere here. It's here somewhere. I know I have faith. I haven't put it to use much lately. It may, may be you. Our faith is progressive. If you are not growing in your Christian life, your faith will remain fragile and shallow. And always susceptible to collapse when battered by the inevitable storms of life in this fallen world. One commentator that I read suggests there are three levels of authentic God-given faith. Number one, saving faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the faith God gives us to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. And then there is growing faith that begins to bear fruit. That's when our faith begins to bear fruit in our lives. I'm talking about Galatians 5 fruit. When the Christian who has been given this faith and is growing in his faith begins to demonstrate more of the fruits of the Spirit and fewer of the fruits of the flesh, he or she is kinder where she used to be harsh more compassionate where she used to be judgmental. More faithful than when they used to be not so faithful. More consistent in his Christian life. That he has been less likely to explode. Less likely to hate. Less likely to, to respond with feelings rather than compassion. And there's no way to faith. And that's the highest level I think, folks. And that's kind of faith that's growing because we are in the Word. We are studying God's Word in Scripture. We are participatory in the community of saints as Christian brothers and sisters. It is my prayer, Paul wrote, that your love, and may I add, your faith, may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That will become less of a bumper sticker kind of a thing in your life and more of a defining characteristic of your person. Now, all this can be learned from the story of Thomas. And for me, it's an opportunity to, to reflect on this, the quality of my faith right now. Not just at this moment in this place, but in all the areas of my life where my faith is being tested. As I get older and become aware that I'm older, like this past week, uh, like the 12 hours I spent in Hershey Park that I'll never get back again, that just tongue wore me out. You're like, you're an old man. You're old. You're too old for this nonsense. And it makes you begin to think, wait a second, now, do I have the faith to be old? Do I have the faith to grow old? Facing what's going to be pretty much bad news the rest of your life, physically. Do I have the faith to trust God with the rest of my life? And not just say that. To trust God with what's coming down the road for me. Do I have the faith to trust God to guide and direct my children when... They're long out of past my control. They're not following the course maybe I wish they were following in some ways. But do I have faith and trust God? And they'll keep his promise that those who are raised up in the nurture and admonition of God will. 
prevail in that. But the faith and belief that God will get me through this situation I have with my adult child. Or with this diagnosis I just got from my doctor. Or with this financial news coming down the road. Or with this change in my life which is looming ever larger. Do I have a faith? These are good things to ask yourself. Because if you've come to God to faith in Christ, the answer is yes. Lord, help me see it. Help me grab hold of it. I promise to hold on for dear life. I believe. Help my unbelief. It's a good prayer. It's a good, honest prayer. And we wouldn't pray every now and then. So whatever your personal issue is that is allowing out to supersede your faith. Remember, they coexist. God can handle them. Commit to the prayer and believe them. Like I said, I'll close with this. There's one place in our Christian lives where doubt has no place, and that is prayer. We read me close to James 1, 5, 2 through 8. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, James writes, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. <coughs> Pardon me. Your faith will be tested and sometimes plays out in agonizing. If any of you lacks any wisdom about any of this, James seems to be saying, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him or her. Let them ask in faith with no doubting. For those who doubt is like, are like waves of the sea that are driven and tossed by the wind. That person, the one who doubts even as he prays, that person must not suppose that he or she will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded, unstable in all their ways. Sometimes that defines my faith. Sometimes I say the words. I hear myself say, say, hear myself say they're the right words. And I'm praying in a way that is so detached, so far removed from faith, that I realize I was making noise. I was making verbal noise. Good lesson for us. Doubt is real. It has substance, but so does faith. Doubt is real. It affects how we think. So does faith. Faith is of God, and it has more power than all the doubts that our fellow man can come up with. The notion is to keep it fresh, to be aware of our inability to hold it closely all the time, and to trust God to keep his promises. Pray honestly. I believe all this, Duke. I hope God helps my unbelief. He will. Praise to his name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thomas is a good reminder every few years. Uh, when we hear his name, we usually think of him as a failure. Lord, we know he was not. <coughs> he accomplished great things by your Spirit's power, even though he had that moment of doubt. We have them too. Some of them are lasting for a long time, Father. And some of us also have what can be only described generously as dormant faith. We have given you a serious thought in a long time, even though we know that. My prayer, Father, is that everyone in this room responds to this message and has their faith rekindled and their doubts honestly assessed and addressed and prayed. Help us not to be afraid to go to others for help and for prayer. Not to be too proud to confess when doubt has become our mantra, has replaced faith as the most powerful influence in our lives. And Father, I pray for everyone here this morning who has a good reason for doubt. There's a reason that is in their lives that they've prayed about and had people pray about and nothing has changed and they've begun to wonder. Father, may those people be given ears to hear what you would say whether it be yes or no, that their faith be in the and a path forward may be here. I pray these
these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close.